Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the bearable bull here. And I got this aggressively average content for you today. As ladies and gentlemen, I have an important video discussing why I will never be selling my XRP. But first, I have a lot to break down for all of you, especially why I'm making that statement. XRP was meant to solve a multi-trillion dollar problem, and currently, it's only at a $35 billion market cap. If you don't get it by now, then you never will. XRP is still under a trillion dollars, which I believe is a catastrophe. Buying XRP now is highway robbery, and it is your golden ticket into winning the lottery in slow motion. Because I genuinely believe we are in the final days of us being able to buy XRP under a dollar forever. This is your last chance. And if you don't take advantage, you'll never get this opportunity back. The big reason is because regulations and regulatory clarity are coming to the crypto market. And if you don't want to believe me, you can let these bankers let all of you know that these regulations are coming and once they're passed it will open the floodgates for all of our generational wealth what happened to crypto world in 2022 it really plunged from a DeFi summer into a crypto winter and then subsequently there were lots of debate about whether that would the decline path whether it would get into a, a crypto spring or an ice age um, the recent incident seems to be pushing it further into springtime rather than ice age in terms of crypto world, judging from the valuation of some of the assets that we have seen. But nonetheless, um, having seen what we have seen, um, indeed, I can come to two possible sort of um, very conjectural, I have to say, um, conclusions. One is if the crypto winter didn't kill it, probably it is there to stay for longer than we originally expected. And secondly, you already mentioned regulation. Probably we have to start thinking about how can we at least put some of the crypto activities that we think are of greater economic value into the realms of regulation. Crypto is here to stay. They're not going to kill it. If they wanted to, last year would have been their opportunity to off the heels of FTX. But the corruption and the conflicts of interest of Sam Bankman-Fried and the SEC have been exposed. Grayscale has been winning their cases. Ripple's 3-0 against the SEC. They tried to kill the baby in the carriage before it could walk, but now the crypto market is walking. The crypto market is about to reach the teenage years. And with regulations, nothing can stop us. And that is going to be a major talking point and priority this next year into the next election cycle. But here, guys, let me explain to you, all of you why I will never sell my XRP. And let me actually elaborate. Of course, I'm going to take some profits off of my XRP as I've been waiting too damn long. I do have my exit targets ready to go, and I will be letting all of you know on my channel directly when I'm taking profits and how much at a certain period in time. But I will never, ever, ever sell all of my XRP. And a big reason is because, one, I do believe XRP could reach unbelievable heights one day. So I always want to keep a forever bag of XRP just in case. But two, with automated market makers, you'll be able to earn a yield. And this yield will be constant passive income that us and the XRP community can earn. That, along with F assets. But we're going to be talking about automated market makers right now. And David Schwartz stated, for UNL validators that the only reason to oppose the AMM amendment and XLS 30D is if you don't want the XRP ledger to grow. And here, Mickey B. Fresh does a powerful breakdown discussing this comment that David Schwartz made to the UNL validators. 
And this is a big reason for why I will never sell all of my XRP. Passive income with a generational wealth building asset is the key to unlocking your financial freedom. And I believe XRP will not only allow for generational profits, but also generational passive income. Learn the game, my friends. We're at the front of the line. And we're the smartest community on the planet. So according to David Schwartz on Twitter, about the only reason to oppose the AMM amendment is if you don't want the XRP ledger to grow. That would be rational if you thought the XRPL was currently too broken and couldn't handle it. I don't believe either of those things. And I agree. It was built to be a value exchange. And then he says, regarding the amendment voting process from the UNL validators regarding XLS 30D amendment, he says, in general, validators shouldn't vote yes individually. The community should make a decision, and then validators should nearly all vote yes when they believe the community is on board and enough nodes support the change. So that is very interesting right there because we have 35 UNL validators and they represent the community. And I think it's important that the community knows that and the validators know that as well. Then he goes on to say, the amendment voting process is intended to coordinate activation and prevent activation. If a problem is discovered, it's really not supposed to be a governance mechanism. In my opinion, David Schwartz's opinion, Validators should generally vote what they think the community has agreed on and not what they think is best. I think it's pretty overwhelming. The community is for the automated market maker. I mean, this is a no brainer. The amount of benefits, and I think that hasn't been highlighted enough in a lot of these discussions because I just don't think the knowledge level is there. And the narrative has steered to people scaring others away because of a permanent loss, but not mentioning all the benefits. So basically he's saying when amendments, there's this much effort put into them over two years period that are this monumental that are built to work with the existing technologies and core protocols. This isn't some amendment that's outside the box, that's bringing some extra extravagant new feature that's never been tested before. Now there you have it. An excellent breakdown as always from Mickey B. Fresh. As ladies and gentlemen, this is a big reason why I'm never going to completely sell all of my XRP. Profit taking is key and essential to making money and de-risking. It's essential to take profits when you believe that you could secure capital for yourself, your family, and your own life's improvements. But you also have to think about the long game. And the technology is being built here now to support the long game for you and your family. Now, to cap off this video for today, I'm going to play you a longer clip from 801XRP. Showing a clip from the CC Data Summit of October 12, 2023. And the policy director of EMEA, Andrew Whitworth, is discussing the future of central bank digital currencies and digital money. And in there he stated, certainly, Ripple, my company, sees that in the future there will be a mix of different types of physical, digital, private, and public money. There are some important nuggets for you to take out of this. And I'm going to leave you with this powerful clip for the day. Now, for those of you in my OnlyFans community, 
I have told you. The crypto I have put my profits from Chainlink into. And I have responded to most DMs. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And if you're a random YouTube subscriber or just coming upon my channel, subscribe to my OnlyFans at OnlyFans.com slash The Bearable Bull. As we're changing lives and quite literally printing profits from the most recent positions we've taken. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Bearable Bull here. Thanks for tuning in. As always, I appreciate every single one of you. Now I'll be back tomorrow with another video. To start at the very beginning, what is money? And what's the difference between the money we have today and what the Bank of England refers to as new forms of digital money? Yeah, well, thanks. I have not this question. What is money? 5,000 years or so. Hopefully, not the same, same answer, uh, at least if you believe. And what the kind of future ecosystem of digital money is going to look like. So, to get started on this, um, Andy, to start at the very beginning, what is money? And what's the difference between the money we have today and what the Bank of England refers to as new forms of digital money? Yeah, well, thanks. I have not this question. What is money? 5,000 years or so. Hopefully not the same, same answer, uh, at least if you believe The Economist, which, which I do. Um, so, I mean, famously, I think, and maybe money has three functions. Uh, it's a store of value, it's a means of exchange, and it's a unit of account. At different times, people focus more on one part of this or the other. But traditionally, something needs to have all three of these functions to... to uh, traditionally, well, again, <laughs> very different. Um, traditionally, something needs to have all three forms of this, um, uh, all three functions of this to um, to to count as money. Well, that's gone through the back. Yeah, um, to count as money. Um, I think when it comes to the debates we're all having today, we've seen how this has played out with people focusing one part more than the other. So, you know, when talking about stable coins, is often thought about as a means of payment, but also often thought about as a unit of account, uh, sorry, of a uh, store of value. What I think is quite interesting, and obviously, you know, Bitcoin people talk about this all the time. Uh, what I think is quite interesting is this unit of account function, because we often forget about it. And the more I think about it, the more this is where the sort of relevant definition of money comes from. So if you think about it, when you're paying for something, particularly in the modern world with fiat, where it's not linked to gold or it's not linked to anything else, of course, we all know you're just paying with something that other people have accepted they would accept uh, on behalf of something because it has a certain nominal value. Uh, and obviously, you know, we're well aware of what's going on in, with inflation in various countries and things like that, where the nominal value can separate out from, uh, from the value of the goods underneath and you end up with different prices, things like that. Now, what I think is interesting when it comes to the digital, um, the idea of digital money, uh, these future forms of money you're talking about, is that what we're seeing is different types of this, be it crypto asset, be it stable coin, be it tokenized deposit or CBDC, targets different functions of the traditional uses of money. Um, where I think we're at now compared to where we were whenever it was, 10, 12 years ago, when um, this whole sector first started, is I think the question of unit of account has been settled, settled definitively, and settled definitively in favor of fiat definitions of money. If you think of somebody you know, in the days when these existed called a Bitcoin billionaire, that didn't mean they had a billion Bitcoin. It means they had a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin or pounds or whatever. Um, similarly, stable coins, when you think of Libra as the first one to come along that was going to be backed by, originally by a basket of currencies um, and was going to be worth one Libra that was you know, whatever it was worth around the world, now stable coins are very much backed by a single currency. They don't have to be, but they are, or they do tend to be, uh, although you can very well correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and in a sense, they are piggybacking off the unit of account function of a fiat, uh, fiat currency. So I think what we're now talking about when we talk about different digital forms of money uh, and their interaction with the traditional financial sector uh, is where does the technology that we have, you know, blockchain usually, um, where does that help for the different functions, the store of value or the um, means of exchange? 
And I think what we're seeing is these different types, as I say, CBDC, crypto assets, um, stable coin, tokenized deposit. They have different benefits, different costs, different trade-offs. Um, some of these, in a sense, are operating in a different financial world compared to traditional financial fiat monies. Um, and what we need is an on or off ramp between the fiat world and the digital asset world, digital money world. Um, some of them are replicating the fiat world on or trying to replicate the fiat world on chain. I think that's where I'd place stable coin, where I'd place CBDCs, maybe tokenized deposits too. Um, so they have different functions, different benefits, different costs, different trade-offs. When it comes to looking to the future, to me what matters, therefore, is the transparency to understand what are the different characteristics of these different forms of digital money. Uh, the education so people get it, so they know what they're getting, they understand what that means. Um, and then the interoperability between them. So can you move between one or the other? Now, there is a bit of a debate about whether that needs to be total free interoperability at all times. I tend to think it does. You could say, well, actually, if you know that a bank deposit is stickier than cash in your wallet, and everyone you know, theoretically does know that, Actually, does it matter you know, if a digital form of money has different characteristics? They're not perfectly always interoperable or, or convertible, uh, frictionless between one and the other. As I say, I think what matters is that they can ultimately be exchanged for each other, that people know what they're getting and they understand what the trade-offs of these things are. Ultimately, I see, certainly Ripple, my company, sees that the in the future there will be a mix of different types of money, physical, uh, digital, private, and public. Um, and really what matters is that the firms in this space work together to create a space where consumers or end users, whatever they may be, understand what they're getting and know how to move between this in a, in a coherent way. Ed, before we move on to CBDCs. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so I mean, just on that, on that last point around the same um, activity, same risk, same regulatory outcome, I mean, obviously, we all agree with that. I think sometimes, and that's used often as a sort of shorthand of saying tech neutrality or, or public institutions have tech uh, neutrality as an objective, which is interesting and, and I would personally consider correct. Um, but it does presuppose same activities. And actually, is a stablecoin doing the same thing as a bank deposit? Now, I'm not going to go back to my previous speech around store of value versus means of payment, but I think I'm right in saying that most stablecoins are used for payment. Mm -hmm. That's very different to storing your money in a bank account. So I think the mantra of same activity, same risk, same regulatory outcome is, is correct, something we will support. But I think there can still be more thinking around whether these are actually the same activities or what is the same activity that we're talking about here. Mm. You often hear um, certain traditional financial actors essentially arguing for the extension of the prudential regime for banks to new you know, digital, digital institutions, digital firms. And you know, in some places that might be correct, but in some places it may not, because as you say, or as you said, I mean, they're not doing fractional reserve banking. You know, uh, actors in the space are not creating credit in the same way that, uh, that a traditional bank is. So there are very different risks to the financial stability, to the wider economy, and to consumers. So I think we, we need to be a bit, a bit careful when we, when we sort of apply the mantra of, of same uh, activity risk and, and regulatory outcome. <clears throat> Thank you. So let's talk about central bank digital currencies um, and, and maybe let's start about with the why for central bank digital currencies. So before we start to, you know, explore the digital pound and maybe touch on the digital euro in a little bit more detail, um, the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee. And that's not to say that retail CBDCs or I know that we've spoken about not really liking this distinction. Well, reasoning for a CBDC is quite clear. Uh, or there, there are many of them, whether that's upgrading the um, innovation system or the, the uh, you know, innovating for the payment system, sorry, of, a, of the domestic um, financial system, uh, or whether that's to improve financial inclusion. Um, you know, Ripple does quite a lot of work with central banks around the world to help them figure out what they want to do with a CBDC, do some pilot projects, help them understand the technology. For a lot of these central banks, and these tend to be in emerging economies, it is about financial inclusion. Like we have one famous pilot with Palau, it's not a plug, but you know, they've got many islands. And until very recently, they had to ship, physically ship in ships cash to each island. Now that's difficult, dangerous, expensive, inefficient. So they're very interested in developing some kind of CBDC, or in their case, because they're dollarized uh, sort of stablecoin solution. So you can see that there are benefits. Now, maybe these aren't all the same benefits in each country. Um, so again, it goes back to the point of, well, what do you want it for? What, 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 what do you need it for? But I think there are public policy benefits. The bit I still have a bit of a question around is what the retail use case is. I mean, or well, use case for retail users. 
And I think a lot of central banks have, uh, they are, I know they are thinking about this, the DPF is thinking about this, they have a very good working group on use cases. Um, they exist, but they can be quite niche. And if the idea is to get mass adoption from the public in a developed economy who already have payments on their phone, yeah. digital payments, online payments, yeah. that could be quite difficult because coming up with a plethora of, you know, how many hundreds of individual use cases is not the same as saying, well, actually, you, you know, digital um, uh, contactless payments, sorry, they took off when you could use it on the tube in London, in the UK, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't think we've seen or we've worked out what that like killer happen. use case is for CUDCs in a country like the UK. And maybe we don't need one. And I, personally, I'm quite taken by the Bank of England's approach of saying, look, we're doing this to develop the infrastructure. In the future, the private sector will innovate on that. Partly that's kicking a can down the road and passing the buck, fine. But also I think if you look at, and I'm sorry to get very technical here, but if you look at the PSD2, so the Payment Service Directive, the second Payment Service Dir Directive in the EU, mm -hmm. uh, which came out five, six years ago, that I would argue has created the fintech and payments PSP landscape that we know today. It wasn't intended to, but it has done. I think a CBDC might do something similar. Yeah, mm -hmm. actually building on on that, what Andrew said. So uh, PTSD, uh, not PTSD. That's post traumatic stress disorder. We've all got that now from crypto, but uh, PSD three is in their own currency, and um, that's maybe the most one of the problems that I have with. Um, let's say stablecoin proliferation. I don't have an answer for it, but uh, that's a big reason behind, I think, CBDC thinking. And I'm sure Andy's got some thoughts on that. We really are just passing the bar. Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I mean, for me, I mean, who are you kidding? The difference between a CBDC is the link to the state, um, public sector, central bank, how are you going to call it? Like, that is a fundamental difference. And whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing is will depend on your politics. And a lot of people, particularly in the... Web3 blockchain crypto space has different politics to people in traditional financial space. I think a large part of the conversations we will have is precisely around that, that like um, outlook on the world. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that's good because you, if you think the state is powerful and has your best interests in heart, then you think the link to the state will make it safer or ultimately be a store, a place you can run to if there is risk in the financial system in your bank deposits. If you think the state or if the state you live in um, is less benign or you're less confident in it, then you think that the CBDC is linked to a state, well, I assume you would think that would be a less desirable thing. Um, so I think, in a sense, we're, we're moving beyond the use case design function question here into a broader one, a political economy, which we'd like to talk about, but maybe more of a drinks afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the first point. The second point is I do have some sympathy for central banks when it comes to stable coins, perhaps kind of what you're alluding to, Kenny, because, you know, I don't, I don't know if we want to see a world in which every country's economy is ultimately dollarized. Um, I don't say that because I have any problem with the United States, not at all. But I think if we think that individual states of individual nations have the duty and right to do what they think is best for the needs of their citizens, well, independent monetary policy is a pretty large plank of that. Um, it's up to, again, it's up to individual countries whether they want to exercise that or not. Mm -hmm. But I think it is right that there should be some framework that, now, th that should allow them to manage this for in the way they think is best. Now, that framework could be regulation on stable coins. It could be on limitations of foreign stable coins. It could be on creating a CBDC. Probably some mix of all of these, right? But um, but I think that does. I think it is perfectly correct for states to have this kind of role in managing the development and the flows of this kind of potentially extra sovereign form of money in their own economy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Building on what, what what the guys have said, and absolutely, I agree with, with it. I think it just it, it ultimately actually comes down to a a function of trust. How much? Do you I mean. Not to be facetious, but it's not that governments will struggle to bring the population along, it's central banks will struggle to bring the government along. Because before, I mean, I think every central bank is very clear that given the um, sort of re resale impact this a central bank digital currency as envisaged could have, they want parliamentary or governmental approval of this and, you know, to go through the legislative process. So the real challenge is for a central bank to develop something which they can then sell to the government and parliament. Then there'll be a next stage argument over or discussion over how, why individuals would want to use it or whether they accept it or not. Although you might think, hopefully, in a representative democracy, that the discussion in Parliament would itself go in some way to answering that second stage. Mm. I think there's also like it's become a proxy for a freedom, a freedom sort of movement. You know, I don't want, I don't want the digital money. Um, what's your your vision of kind of what's going to happen in the next five years and what that ecosystem will look like in the future? And we'll start with Andrew. Oh, thank you. Um, so. 
I mean, I, I, I guess I alluded to this in my opening uh, remarks. Like, I, I fully believe that we will see all these forms of money in the future, including cash, including commercial bank deposits, as we know today, including e-money, which we didn't bring up, which is very similar to stable coins in many ways. Um, yeah, in many ways. Um, and then also the stable coins, CBDCs, tokenized deposits, um, and crypto assets as well. As I said, I mean, ultimately, I think these are all ways of transferring value from one person to another. Uh, now, that may be over time, so from yourself today to yourself in the future, could be to another person in the form of a payment today. Ultimately, they're all forms of all money. Everything we're talking about is just a different way of transferring value. How much does it cost you to do that? How easy is it to do it? How traceable? How redeemable? Well, the ways around it, that's what we're discussing here. I think what's interesting, and very much to Rami's point, is that the technology has caught on. What we're discussing now is the business case behind the technology for different forms of institution, public and private.